All right, if you have your Bibles with you tonight, we'd ask you to turn to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 28. Hebrews chapter 10, and beginning in verse 28. The Bible says, He that despised Moses' law without mercy under two or three witness, of how much sore punishment suppose ye that ye be, wor ye be thought worthy who have trodden under the Son of God and have counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified as an unholy thing, and who have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that have said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you, endure, you endured great, a, a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you became companions of, companions, of, companions of them that were so used for ye had compassion of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring and an enduring place Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience. After that, ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For a little while, and he, that have, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Now, the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But ye are not of them who draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and praise you for the book that's laid before us this evening. God, what a protector of your people it's been down through the years, and what an educator of our hearts it remains. God, we pray tonight that you would open your word unto us one more time this side of eternity. Draw the lost into yourself. Give them newness of life. Those of us that are our redeemed God, remember how humble we ought to be before your throne. And we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, we'll be preaching tonight, really kind of found in the last of the 39th verse, how much do you believe? Now, how much you believe this word is how you'll live your life. Irregardless what you want to say about it, how much you believe the word of God will dictate how you live your life. If you believe it as a glance, your service will be very, very minuscule. Uh, if you believe it at a glance, there's nothing to draw you to it. Uh, if you believe it in just a uh, a moderate way on Sunday you might do some things and the rest of the week will be null and void. But if you believe this book and your belief is deep, it will impact every minute, every second of your entirety of your day. That's what true belief does. <clears throat> and we find the writer, whom I believe was Paul, say this belief to the saving of the soul. Now, I've seen that kind of taken out of context and, and, and come out, somehow bring the fact, try to bring out a fact, which is not fact, that somehow God measures your level of belief and that, and that uh, dictates if you go into glory or not. Uh, nothing further could be from the truth. What your level, your level of belief is already defined by what you do how you live this present life. And the only way to leave a, a live a, pre, a, a pleasing life this side of eternity is to have been saved to start with. Now, as we grow 
so should our faith. Faith and belief are essentially the same thing. And as we grow, our belief in that book should be greater today than it was yesterday. And as Brother Jarrett was saying, and he's right on uh, the pen, uh, the point of the pen is the devil's divide and conquer. It's out there. And when you don't have the, the fellowship of a church, or in our area, thankfully, churches, he's dividing, and uh, you become weaker and weaker. Now, so what this makes us ask ourselves then is what level of belief do you have? Now, there must be levels, or he wouldn't say believe to the saving of your soul. He wouldn't say believe, uh, you know, uh, Garner Smith used to say that he, he was so, had so much faith in the person of Christ that he'd swing across hell on a dry corn stalk. And listen, that's a good way to live. And you know what? The older I get, the more I understand what he meant by that comment because we are depend completely dependent on God in the life to come and we're completely <laughs> dependent on God in this present life too. Now somehow we want to debate that one. And it never, the only thing that you have that you come into this world with and you'll go out with this is your never dying soul. Man. And how could, you know, that's the problem with Armenian teaching. We easily place our soul in the hands of God, but we have trouble somehow placing this present life in its hands. Um, that makes no sense whatsoever. This life is, this life is short at best. Mm -hmm. and, and so it, it, ha it has no real value when you think about it compared to time and eternity. So we find the writer is giving... Uh, huh, giving some emphasis on looking at your own level of belief or faith. Now let's go back to uh, verse 28, and he makes this point, he that des uh, despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Now there was a lot of people that hated the law. Now the reason individuals hated the law, it defined who they were. It showed just how sinful and ungodly the heart of man is. Not that it would just do wrong, but rather that it would choose to do wrong. That, that's why the law was hated so much. The Bible says in the New Testament that it has become our schoolmaster. It defines sin. Heard that all my life, but what we really don't like, it defines the nature of mankind. It defines who we are. And that is something that we really, we really don't want to get delved deep into. And it says that everybody that despised that, and it said it died under two or three witnesses, uh, dictating, recording, uh, understanding what they were. Verse 29. Of how much sore punishment this death between two, three, two or three witnesses how much sore punishment suppose ye shall be, be thought worthy who have trodden under the foot under foot the Son of God? Now, I do not personally believe that he's just talking about the day of crucifixion. That was, that was destined to come. It was going to happen. It happened exactly like it was supposed to happen on the day that it was supposed to happen, at the time it was supposed to happen, and it was fulfillment of God. Now, trotting the death of Jesus is trotting his sacrifice as you walk over it, saying it's not worthy. It gets me started, but I've got to keep it going. Mm. That's trotting it under. That, that's saying it's not, not sufficient. No. Or even saying, hey, Christ is one way, but there's a lot of other ones out there too. They're trotting the person of Christ under their feet. And you see it time and time again. The Pope, he, tell, he tells that ungodly group that he's their mediator. No, Christ is the mediator. He always has been, always will be. You know what that group is doing? They're trying the work of Christ under their feet. Mm -hmm. And he says that's worse punishment than the Jews get. That, that's more sore, that's more severe, that's more difficult than what they will experience in the time to come. 
of how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall ye be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the Son of God and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified by, as an, an unholy thing? Now, how do you count the blood of Christ as something unholy? I can tell you how, saying it's not sufficient. Right. That's counting it unholy. Mm -hmm. That's counting it common. That's counting it as an everyday thing when you do not count the blood of Christ the only way to be in, the, in glory one day. And we have a world load of people that's counting it that way. Now, I love the teachings of grace, but listen, if there was no sacrifice, there would be no grace. If he didn't wash our sins away with his own precious blood, grace would be a fable. But thanks be to God, he did. And, and we find a day where there is people that literally do, uh, that do this. Uh, what was it, uh, 10 years ago now? Uh, uh, Barack Obama stood up and said, we are no longer a Christian nation. Well, first of all, you need to speak for yourself. And then secondly, I'll say this, what he was really doing was this right here. Trodden the blood of Jesus under, under the feet of a nation. You know, the people don't take serious enough about uh, uh, picking out that ballot, do they? Because, you know what, I fully believe this, everybody that voted for that man was just as guilty of what he said than he was himself. And, and so we find that there's a huge group of people that do not see the preciousness of the uh, uh, blood of Jesus. We sing that song, Oh, precious is the flow that makes me uh, whiter than the snow. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we find in the day which we live that is no longer a common true, uh, doctrine that has been despised of men. Verse 30, for we know him that has said, vengeance belongeth unto me. Now, this is a truth that's only revealed to his people. But you know what? Madam Melvin O'Hare, killed by her own people for her, for her own money, <laughs> she faced God, and his full vengeance was upon her. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? They, these men marrying men, if God don't intervene, they'll, fa they'll face the full wrath of God. Yeah. Now, I believe specifically why he said that, that belongs to God. In other words, you don't worry about the punishment. You know, you know, when we get off trying to force someone believe, to believe or force them to live the way we want them to live, you've missed the boat. You, you know the only thing that we can do to lost people is give them the gospel. Anything, anything else will not work. If you don't believe that, ask the Quakers, ask the Puritans. They live this way, do this, do this, do this. And you know what? For the majority, those groups don't even exist anymore. And you know why? Because they were not Bible-based groups. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And, and so Paul gives them, or whomever the writer is, gives them, them this reminder that it's the blood of Christ. Don't worry about judgment. That's in the hand of God. Now, verse 31, and everybody listen to me, the lost and the saved included, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, say, folks, what a wonderful, glorious thing it is. This is one you won't have to worry about. Well done, thou good and faithful yeah, servant. It. But for the lost... It's a fearful thing. Yeah. And, and you know what? The, the in the hands of a in the hands of God, you know what? That's judgment. Whose kids do you whip? I whip my own kids. Those that belong to me. Now I don't whip my grandkids because they don't do anything wrong. They. Uh, but you know why I really don't whip them? They don't belong to me. 
and every living being belongs to God. Now, some under his glory and some under his wrath. What's the Bible say concerning Esau and Jacob? Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. Where do you, which group do you think Esau? I believe Esau fall into fell into the hands of an angry God, don't you? Why is God angry? It's his natural, holy response to sin. That uh, his being could have no other. The, 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 the magnitude of his grace and his gloriness and his, and his holiness could have no other thing. So he reminds the sinner, and for that part, the redeemed, this is what's going to happen. So when we see things that perplex us, remember those people are under the authority of the Almighty. You know, some of the things that President Biden says, I just have to shake my head. And I remind myself, God is in control. Amen. Nothing to be feared, nothing to be worried about. Our God doeth what seemeth good unto himself. And, and, and so we find that within this, just always remind yourself and what encouragement it is that God will get the last judgment. You know, the Bible even says that on the day of the last judgment. So there's some judgments now, but the last judgment is coming. You need to make your calling and election sure. Verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, saved, saw the light, understood grace, been born again, ye endured great a great fight of afflictions. Now, the redeemed ought to not only expect affliction, but rejoice in it as well. Now, when afflictions come, how many of you truly rejoice? Well, I'll say first of all, it scares me, and it scares me really, really bad. I very frequently say this, and I remember because it was so etched in my mind, when Adam's fever was 105, and I had that little kid in my hands, and I didn't know what I was going to do with him. He, he just burning hot. You know what? I didn't rejoice in the Lord. One thing back then, I didn't understand God was sovereign. And the other thing, when you got a one-year-old baby, you think it's going to have a seizure because they're so hot. You know what I was concerned about? Me and Donna hopped in that little red car, and fast as we could get to Martin, that's how, that's where we took him. And I never thought about God being exalted in that. We're going to go through afflictions. And remember, in the midst of, of affliction, God is the author of it. And his saving power from that situation, it's not a response, it's a plan. He doesn't respond to our devil, to the devil's attacks. He makes the, he, he makes the whole scenario up before it even begins. If you don't believe that, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth. Who, who initiated that? Who initiates all things? God. <laughs> and, and, and so we find here that he says you were doing great. You understood the affliction. You understood the reason of the affliction. And you were coming through the affliction with flying colors. Verse 33. Why? Partly while you were made a gazing stock. Now think about a gazing stock. A couple of things with that. Number one, a gazing stock is where you're locked up in the middle of the town for something that you did, and people come by and look at you and make fun of you and, and give you a little gouge and all that goes with that, and they just make fun of you. Now, in the modern day, we don't have stocks like they did in, in the Bible times, but people do make fun of you, do they not? Oh, Larry, you're such a prude. Don't you want to get out and drink a little bit? You're such a weirdo. 
You're goofing, Scott. You mean to tell me you believe that God foreknew a people before the world began? How stupid! I decided to follow Jesus. You're gazing stock. You're to be made fun of. You're to be scrutinized. That, that's, the, that's the modern day. And he says, don't you remember when all this happened? And instead of being embarrassed, instead of being upset, instead of being boiling anger, you did it, you, you withstood it fine. In fact, you did good with it. Uh, you endured. Partly while you were gazing stock, both uh, reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. Now what does that mean? That means when we find someone that's in a situation like this, we're to become their companion. You find somebody that's suffering for the name of Jesus, I mean truly suffering for the name of Jesus, you get in there with them. Everybody remembers uh, Wayne Adams, most of you. Yeah, Sarah, if Adam hadn't told you about him, ask, ask him tonight. And um, do y'all know he was locked up for preaching the gospel? He truly was. And it wasn't in Siberia, it was at Louisville. And it was simply like this. He refused to take a license to preach. And you know what? I won't take one either. And you better not either. Because you know what? No government authority is going to control what I say or do in the ministry. And uh, <laughs> they locked up Wayne. He got down at the Louisville jail. And if you've ever been down to Louisville, listen, it. It, it, it's not a nice place. He got head lice, body lice. And you know the only one person after all that happened? Two people ministered to his needs. Linda and Kenny. That's the only two that, that sought cooking things that he needed. He needed, uh, he needed uh, lice shampoo. You know who took it to him? Kenny Long. I've never needed lice shampoo. You want to go buy a two-gallon bottle? Jared, you know what everybody's going to think, don't you? Jared Shungins has got lice, right? It's embarrassing, don't it? Where are you going today, Linda? Well, I'm going down to the jail to see Wayne. What if I was down there? What if my babies and my grandbabies, well, we're going to go see granddaddy. He's over at the jail. See what I'm saying? It's different when it becomes real, is it not? It's different when you have to apply it to yourself. And he says, when you did all these things, not only you began to help people that was worse off than you, that had a more difficult time than you. For you had companions of me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. Now, what are you saying? You knew I was in the clean too. I was down at Rome locked up for preaching the gospel and for not compromising, and you sent to my needs. See, even as rough as Wayne's experience was, they did get food at the Louisville jail, and they, and they did get water. See, back in <laughs> the 2,000 years ago, or nearly 2,000 years ago, in the day of Paul the Apostle, Listen, jails weren't like they were today. You know how you got food? If somebody brought it to you. That was it. And he says, well, you use, up of your, you use some of your own money, and I had something to eat. You know, uh, you're going to be a little embarrassed to send preachers food, money, because it's coming, if they stick to the stuff. Now, if you're a compromiser, you're going to be fine. But if you stick to the stuff, you want to have somebody to help you out because it's coming. And he says, you did great with this. You, you are a help to those people. You were what they needed in a time of distress. So what does all this mean to those believers that were doing this? You know why they did it? You know what motivated them to 
even went to the hazard of their own lives, I think is how he puts it in Timothy. You know why they did that? It was their level of belief. So, if we don't do it, we can only believe the flip side, right? That we don't have enough belief to put her into operation. Right? The only reason you can, the only reason you can come to, correct? And, and so we find today, that's why we have to, we have to evaluate our belief level is by what we do. What, what, what we do is a reflection of what we believe. Verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which had great recompense of reward. How's your level of confidence tonight? What's your confidence level in the person and the completed work of the Lord Jesus Christ? What is your confidence level in God's plan for your life? Not, not your plan for your life, but what is your confidence level in God's plan for your life? Your, his plan is very different than yours. I would say that rest assured. And on top of that, his plan is going to have a lot more bumps in the road. Your wheels is going to fall off more frequently than your plan. And it's going to be a very, very difficult time. But he says, in all that, don't cast away your confidence that you have in God. You know what gets me up every morning and keeps me going for another 24 hours? is my confidence in God. On the way to work this morning, I was listening to this song I have on my phone. Uh, <laughs> see that cloud? It may be the one he's coming back on. Now, I was crossing the Tennessee River when I was, when I was uh, listening to that, and there's some clouds on the west side of the river. And I was thinking, well, you never know. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what keeps me going. Mm -hmm. You know um, what the devil will tell you? It's never going to happen. That's a fairy tale. Or, and it, it, say what you will, this will reduce your belief to some level. It ain't gonna happen in your lifetime. Well, how do you know? You know what, you may end up out there, I don't know. But I also know this, in an hour which you think not, behold the Son of Man cometh. Mm -hmm. See, that means it's any time, right? That, that means it's, your, it's just a breath away and we'll be at home with the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the ceaseless ages. And so he said, don't give up your confidence because that's still a reality. That is still the truth. Even today, that is still something that we have to look forward to. Verse 37. For yet a little while, he that shall come will come and will not tarry. That's a hard statement to take in. In a way, I feel it thrilling, and it increases my faith. And then because of this carnal flesh and this ungodly mind, mm -hmm. I think it literally, since this writing, probably 1,900 years, and maybe even more, He was anxious then, wasn't he, Jerry? And in the flesh's eye, you're like, man, it would have happened by now. No, no, no. The Bible says this, that the Son, even the Son of Man, the Son of God, right. don't know the day or the hour. Right. Right. You know what? I believe the thing of it is, though, Jesus is a lot more patient waiter than we are. I bet he ain't even blinked his first eye. I'm wondering, well, Dad, when are you going to get this thing over with? Because he's part of the Godhead. He understands the mind of God. And we don't. We have to live like it's going to be today. And you know, I dare say this for myself, I know so. I don't live that way. 99% of the time, I even go 99.99% .99 of the time, I don't live my life as though he could come at any second and to my own detriment. That's why I get discouraged. 
That's why I get down and out. That's why sometimes I throw up my hands and quit and say, this has been a waste of my time. Then I'm reminded by the person of the Holy Ghost, and yet a little while, and I come. And, 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 and then I become thrilled again and just sitting on the edge of my seat waiting for the day. Verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. Not by what they see, not by what they hear, but by faith. I know y'all all remember a few years back that fellow thought he had it figured out when Christ was coming. Y'all remember that? And then he said his figures were wrong and give the Lord another week or so. Mm -hmm. You know what? Christ didn't come. And I tell you two reasons why. Number one, the word of God it says it's of itself. No man knoweth the day or the hour. And secondly, he cometh when an hour that you think not. And he was thinking he was coming. <laughs> so I knew he wasn't coming. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we see then that what sustains us in these near 2,000 year interim that's happened since the days of Paul the Apostle, the only thing that keeps you going, I can't give you a magical formula, the only thing that keeps me going is my faith. And blessed be the name of the Lord, my faith is grown. I believe it more now than I did when I was 12 years old when the Lord saved me. And, and you know what? I'm getting a little homesick now. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I, I'm very much ready uh, for the Lord to step out and say, it's enough. Come up here. And be at home with the Lord for, for, forever. And so he says, that's how you're going to have to live. That's how you're going to have to manage it till I return. The just shall live by faith and very intertwined with the, the same word believe the just shall live by faith by what they believe it should define them but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him now let me tell you what it doesn't say it doesn't say that the drawbackers are going to go to hell and you know what I can attest sincerely to that and you would too if you'd be honest because I've been a back drawer at times. Same thing as a back slider, right? You draw back and say, man, I'm sick of this. No, no. Get in the will of God, repent of that thing and say, Jesus, I'm looking forward to it. I don't know when and I don't know exactly where, but I'm ready for you to come and sit on the edge of your seat. And when you see a lost, ungodly person, don't you be a critic. You go to them, and as sincerely as you can, say, let me tell you about a man named Jesus. He shed his life's blood for your never-dying soul. And you know what? If you do that, that'll take up the majority of your time anyway, right? And so we see, don't be guilty of drawing back, even though we do. So one of the barometers... Do you spend more time here or do you spend more time back here? See, this is drawn back. This is right where you need to be just looking and waiting and helping people along the way. People that are sick. What did it say about Dorcas? Said she made all those clothes that she helped the sick. See, I believe Dorcas was standing Stand on her tippy toes waiting for the day, don't you? That's how I want to live. I, I believe that's fully what the scripture teaches to. Teaches us to is to live as though he's coming back tomorrow. Or even tonight. Verse 39. But we are not of them to draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. So tonight, when you get home and all is quiet, look to yourself. See where your belief level is at. See, are you on the tippy toes? Or have you had taken time to sit down? You know, I believe Jared was right on. Uh, a lot of the Lord's churches are sitting down. And if we all be on our tippy toes, 
We'd all be looking in the exact same direction, wouldn't we? Yeah. Kind of takes the he, she, big, little, all out of the equation, doesn't it? That's where we should live.